John Lennox, welcome to the program. Thank you for joining us. I'm delighted to be here. Thank you for inviting me. It, I mean, it says in the Bible that we should have a reason for what we believe. Absolutely. What is it that you believe and, and what led you to that belief, John? Well, what I believe is the central message of historic Christianity, that Jesus Christ is God incarnate. And for me, the focal point of the evidence for that is the fact that he rose from the dead. So it's historic Christianity that I believe. What led me to that belief? Well, of course, that's a complex of things. My parents were Christians. I come from Northern Ireland. My grandparents were Christians, and so were their parents, I believe. So I was brought up in a strongly Christian environment. But what uh, has been very important to me in my life is that my parents, though they were keen Christians, they allowed me space to think and they weren't sectarian. So I was encouraged to read very widely. And from a very early age, I was put in contact with thinkers like C.S. Lewis and so on, and grew up to question things as I did in my scientific and linguistic interests and all the rest of it. I don't recall a time when if you'd asked me, do you believe in God? I wouldn't have answered yes to that. But of course, the evidence for the truth of Christianity uh, grew. And I suppose one turning point was when I got to Cambridge. And in the first week, a student said to me, do you believe in God? And he said, sorry, sorry, you're Irish. Of course you do. All you people do, and you fight about it. And that was a turning point in the sense that although I'd heard that question before, I thought, well, could he possibly be right that this is Irish genetics, my parents believe, and so on and so on. So on that day, I decided to get to know people who didn't share my worldview, and particularly atheists, agnostics, and so on. And I've been doing that ever since. So I've been sticking my head above the parapet, talking to people, and as life has gone on, that deepening conviction that Christianity is true. That's not a view which is always shared by the, the opposite view, if you like, that you have an interest in, in the views of the atheist and the sceptic, but that's not always intellectually the way in which the atheist and the sceptic respond to Christianity. No, it isn't, because they have got a completely distorted notion of faith which is, to my mind, a very clever cop-out. I mean, Richard Dawkins' idea of faith is believing where not only is there no evidence, but you know there's no evidence. So when he meets somebody like me, he thinks I'm a faith head, so there's no point in talking to me since I believe where there's no evidence. But that is an idiosyncratic view of faith. That's what normally we call blind faith. And the Christian faith is not blind faith. John, in his gospel, puts it so clearly, these things are written that you might believe. Here's the evidence. Faith is a response to evidence. And uh, perhaps the best analogy is the fact that I have faith in my wife. It's based on evidence. I've been married for 42 years. But even at the very beginning of the relationship, evidence builds up and you come to trust a person on the basis of that evidence. And I always remind people, because they think I'm going to be as dry as dust, abstract, academic, that God is a person, not a theory. So we're relating to a person. And in personal relationship, trust, unless we're absolutely gullible, is based on evidence. The combination of this faith, particularly within the, the intellectual community, now. I know some of the viewers of this program will be concerned that uh, you know, as they send their children to university that there's many that go to university and lose their faith in the process. To hold on to a robust faith uh, but will not say goodbye to your intellectual integrity, talk to us about the, um, the way in which that sits together for you. Well, I'm a parent and a grandparent. And my parents gave me the greatest gift any parents can give their children. That is love and space to think. And I would certainly encourage parents to allow, particularly Christian parents, allow their children to think because they're going to be exposed to all kinds of counter arguments when they come up to university. And if they've never met them before, that can be devastating. The Christian faith is true, I believe, and therefore it can cope with all the attacks that are leveled against it. Otherwise, it's not worth believing at all. So 
if parents aren't capable of answering their children's questions, the thing they must not do is repress those questions. They must seek out resources and get their kids interested in the dialogue because there's a big dialogue out there. People are actually interested. The bookshops are full of books about who we are, where we came from, where we're going, all this kind of thing. And to get involved in that dialogue, I think, well, I was allowed to get involved in it very early. And I'm so grateful because what I discover is the more you expose your faith and your beliefs to the wind that blows in the opposite direction, the stronger it grows. Do you think it's more difficult to hold on to faith in, in, in the current climate? That um, I'm thinking particularly about the new atheism. Is that something that the Christian community should be concerned about or even fearful of? Well, certainly not fearful of. I mean, one of the great things about the new atheism is it's put God back on the agenda. And uh, I, I'm smiling slightly at your question because when I think of Paul and his team going out to confront the ancient world where there were no churches, there was no Christianity, but there were all kinds of religions and philosophies. They had the courage to go out and do that. So we need to recover a little bit of that courage. And one of the things the new atheists have certainly done is enable us to get into the public square and as best we can point out that their arguments, many of them are specious and tenuous and so on and so forth. But it has activated Christians to do some hard thinking. And that's a very healthy thing. What's been the response from the New Atheists to, um, to the books you've written, to the debates that you've had? Well, I've been very encouraged by the response to God's Undertaker. I've had endless emails and so on. And uh, I, I was quite abused to hear that Richard Dawkins thinks I'm not a flea. He considers many of his opponents to be fleas, irritants that the dog has on his back, so to speak. So I've been encouraged by many letters from around the world, from professors and so on, finding that this has helped them find their way into the heart of the argument. Of course, there are many people who disagree with me. That, that goes with the turf. The concept of the new atheist, and this is perhaps the most difficult thing for the average Christian to come to terms with, these are people who are, well, they're intellectuals, they're the intelligentsia, they have degrees behind their name and they live in this intellectual environment. For the average Christian, we have a faith, we have reasons for our faith. What would you say to encourage people to engage with the debate without getting lost in the process? Well, I, I think the best way is to get engaged exactly where you are. And I often, when I meet people, I ask them questions until they ask me one. And I find it's much easier to ask questions than answer them. And it's important for me to isolate what exactly the question is that my interlocutor is asking. Now, very often I don't know the answer to that because none of us know the answer to every question. But I'll say, look, that's a very interesting question. Can I think about that? And I'll seek out resources and friends and so on. And I find the way to, for this to become real and for us not to be completely overwhelmed with all the information out there is start where we are with our neighbours, with our friends, with the people we drink coffee with. See what the questions are and gradually focus on one question. And then that will soon come to two and so on and so forth. And we'll gradually build up the way in which we can respond that will take people further. But it demands work. Uh, what concerns me sometimes is that Christians will put a lot of effort into their profession, whether it's business or they'll even put a lot of time into watching television or learning up all the rugby scores for the last 50 years. But when it comes to the articulation of their faith something goes wrong. And I suppose when I look at that, the danger as I see it is that our professional development goes at this speed, whereas our spiritual development remains like that. And the moment we begin to open our mouth, people see it, and so our faith gets privatized. And I meet many people in middle life, I'm afraid, who go to church, they will read the Bible, they'll say their prayers, but they've long since lost any cutting edge of articulation of their faith. Now we need to do something about that. It we seems started to me. with the question for people to have a reason for what yes, they that's believe. Right. 
particularly in the face of new atheism, a lot of people are scared to engage in that level. It, it, it gets put into the too hard basket. Well, yes, they believe it, um, but don't really have a theory or even, um, or even a testimony of how they became a Christian and why. Yes, well, that, that needs to be worked on. I, I don't think there are any simple answers to that. But fear, that kind of fear, that sinking feeling in the stomach, that will grow. And we got to realize that the central claim that Jesus made is, I am the truth. He is the truth. And so, therefore, we shouldn't be afraid. It's very interesting, actually, that you mention the word fear, because the, the famous statement you've just quoted, be ready to give an answer, mm. It's often quoted out of its context. The context is, don't be afraid of what they're afraid of. Peter was aware that people are scared. We all get scared. I get scared. That goes with the turf. Debating people like Hitchens and Dawkins is a terrifying thing. But the point is, if we really believe Jesus is the truth, then there are answers to these questions, but we have to dig for them until they become part of our life. We live in a world where political correctness is dominating the public space. And often in the media, it is assumed that the default position is atheism. That's very much true in England. Now, I don't think that that is a very healthy situation. So one of my reasons in debating is not necessarily to convince Dawkins and co. I am a realist. But it's to get into the public space the fact that there's a credible alternative and let the people judge. John Lennox, a pleasure to chat with you. Thanks for joining us today. Pleasure. Thank you.